Good afternoon. What I'd like to do for you this afternoon is just to remind you of some of the infections that can involve the eye area. And some of these we can a lot of times manage. Sometimes you'll see this, you know, people coming in as an outpatient, especially if you're in primary care, walk-in clinics, um, where people usually come in. We do get asked to see some of the more complicated things, but a lot of this is going to need to be uh, also seen by an ophthalmologist or, or you know, trained optometrist in evaluating some of the more complicated things. Some are complicated, some are not. I would highly encourage you to recall and remind yourself of all the structures around the eye because it does make a difference with some of these things, especially you start looking at <coughs> infections going into the eye. So some pretty common things, blepharitis. And people start talking about that. The most common thing is you can see even, which is not on in this discussion, but even seborrheic dermatitis in the eyebrows surrounding the eyelash area. Not only it's in any hair area, you would treat it the same as you would anywhere else. Uh, you can use some low-potency steroids, but you know some uh, ketoconazole cream uh, works just fine. But these are also common as well. Usually, what we're talking about is you know, one of three things, seborrheic dermatitis we talked about, um, staph infections, and that usually is a hordeola or a sty, that most people will know the more common name, or uh, where you have a blockage of the meibomian glands and the lids, and most people uh, are usually not familiar with the term chalazion, which would be a single one, or chalazia, there can be more than one. But there is kind of a difference between those two. Chalazia are really, since it's a backup of secretions, is, is more slow growing and usually is not all that painful, where our styes, since they're inflammatory and infectious, tend to be more uh, of something that people would notice. So you can see a lot of symptoms. There's a lot of variability with this. It may just be some irritation, itching, burning, uh, generally more with a, a sty. Sometimes if they're big enough and they rub on the eye, you get that foreign body or um, kind of what people tell you is a gritty sensation. Uh, may have some tearing occasionally, usually not so much of photosensitivity. Some people might tell you that and maybe a little bit of blurred vision, uh, usually more with just blinking, not when the eye is open. <coughs> so when you're looking at it, you notice a lot of things. Usually you see debris on uh, around the eye, crusting or, or maybe just some scaling. Uh, the lid margins not uncommonly can be reddened um, and as we talked about it just depends on where it's located uh, as far as a chalazia or uh, hordeola. I'll show a few pictures in a second. Um, you might see even with chronic inflammation eyelash loss. Uh, occasionally people can get a chronic conjunctivitis where that they get inflammation but usually it's going to be localized because people will notice there's something wrong with their eye and come and see you. Usually just supportive care, hot compresses to the eye, just tell people to take a washcloth, get it hot, but obviously not, you know, scaldingly hot, and apply it to the area about four times a day, three or four times a day. Really good lid hygiene can help uh, quite a bit. Make sure that uh, they also practice good hand hygiene because that's one of the places where you can get it, especially with staph infections, is touching something and then rubbing your eye. Um, you can also use artificial tears. You can buy those over the counter uh, to provide some comfort while this is uh, resolving itself. Occasionally, uh, if it's chronic or severe, you may need to refer them to an optometrist or ophthalmologist for um, topical steroids or antibiotic ointments uh, just to prevent secondary infections if it's really chronic. Or if, the, if you're seeing um, a hordeola that's really large and needs to be opened, it's certainly, we tell patients leave it alone because, you know, they've got a needle going at their eyelid and the last thing they need is to have a puncture of the orbit while they're trying to stab this sty. Uh, so we'd really have it in, in a controlled environment and then provide something uh, topically to prevent further infection until it's healed. So when you look at uh, these series of uh, pictures here, the one at the left upper just shows you where that you might see a chalazion and shows you location in the mobomian gland. Um, if you look at the, the left uh, upper right area one is uh, showing you a little bit of the early occurrence of what you can see with um, hordeola or styes. Uh, there's a single one you can see even on the bottom one kind of unusual. There's several uh, and some of these are actually draining. 
And then chalasia that you see on the bottom lower lid, uh, again, not uncommon, and a lot of times they resolve on their own. Sometimes they become chronic, and um, I know his, when I was in training, I saw the ophthalmologist that I trained with would occasionally open it up and, and just to clear the material out of it, but that's usually kind of, if nothing else works. Um, the other one is really common that we end up seeing sometimes, and that's going to be viral conjunctivitis, and there's a wide variety of things that can cause a viral conjunctivitis, but uh, usually people know it as pink eye, and uh, I know that many time, or many years ago, someone was trying to tell me that they had gone to their doctor and, and that was told that it was a strep infection in their eye. And then it went to the other eye and said, that's the problem. See, it's strep. Does it? Strep has nothing to do with this. This is all viral. Um, the vast majority of these are adenoviruses, and, and if you like to break the ice at parties, you can always ask which type causes what, and which ones are more common in kids, and which ones are more common in adults. So types 3 and 7 more in children, 8, 11, and 19 in adults. Uh, but there's also this entity that's called epidemic keratoconjunctivitis, where that you can see not only the conjunctiva involved, but even part of the cornea. And that's a little bit more of an issue, because now that the cornea is involved, there is a chance that you can get precipitates forming in the cornea, and this can be, even though it resolves on its own, but it can really disrupt vision. And uh, occasionally they can get really aggressive and, and people can have visual changes or visual loss for long periods of time. So there has been uh, adenovirus type 14, as you may have seen, which may end up appearing as a board question for ID fellows. Uh, what one was associated with severe community acquired pneumonia where there were some deaths and also with epidemic keratoconjunctivitis and that's adenovirus 14. So lucky 13, unlucky 14, I guess. The things with EKC you worry about is that um, people get really significant photosensitivity with that and uh, a really nasty foreign body sensation, but all the others can be um, seen with lots of different things involving the eye, eyes watering, blurry vision perhaps. And again, it's not uncommon to have the other eye get involved, either because people don't wash their hands or when they sleep, they get secretions go from one eye to the other. Uh, again, usually the treatment is just supportive, cold compresses as opposed to hot ones, although some people find benefit from hot compresses with this, so they can try whatever. Artificial tears, um, but for severe keratitis, uh, if this doesn't start getting better within a few days, then you really need to have them seen by an ophthalmologist or optometrist. Um, the reason I know that is my younger daughter had this a few years ago, and they were just kind of, well, it was watch it and see, and it got really significant, and they kind of, well, just a couple times a day steroids and everything, and a few more days later, it wasn't any better, and uh, was seen by the optometrist that we see for our contact lenses who was really worried. It's getting much worse, and I don't want you getting precipitates in the eye because it's going to take forever for this to get better, quote unquote. So then it was uh, topical steroids, much higher doses to taper out, and then some topical antibiotics just to prevent superinfection. So it just depends on the severity. Um, if it's not getting better in a few days, I have a, a low threshold of having someone in the eye field take a look at this. But this is not uncommon. Uh, you can see is the uh, on the left side on the lower one uh, more of a follicular conjunctivitis with this. You see that kind of a cobblestone appearance when you roll the lid down. Uh, suggests more it's going to be viral. And again, the most common one is going to be adenovirus. So pink eye, hence if you look at that one versus the other one, does tend to look pink. Um, the other thing is not really all that common is bacterial conjunctivitis. You see some of the things listed that have been associated with it, Staph aureus, uh, Haemophilus species, uh, including Haemophilus influenza, um, Strep pneumoniae, so good old pneumococcus can cause um, eye involvement uh, really rarely in Moraxella. Um, fortunately, ones that's really uncommon is Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis in the eye. Um, and that's a good reason why it's, it's really good that it's very uncommon because they tend to be very aggressive in the eye. They can cause corneal perforation if they're left untreated. So again, this one is uh, lots and lots of irritation. It's not uncommon to have a, a significant discharge with any of these if you get them, and some intermittent blurred vision. And again, uh, if you're looking at that eye, the most prominent thing you see is a discharge. Uh, the eye is going to look red, and a lot of con uh, conjunctival uh, injection, inflammation. So the best thing is to 
culture and see what's there. And so if you just moisten a swab, put it in a conjunctival sac, try and get a good specimen, send it down for a gram stain, and a culture with susceptibilities would be a great thing. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do. Again, cold compresses, and that's more for comfort. Uh, sometimes warm feels better, so you can try whichever. Artificial tears uh, to keep things well lubricated. And um, usually, it, once that you're pretty sure this is bacterial, then people start with broad-spectrum antibiotics four to six times topically a day. That's a labor of love. Six times a day drops in your eye. And they always say, while awake. If it hurts really bad, you're not asleep. You probably would stay awake. And you see say, a lot of things listed. Um, topical fluoroquinolones, uh, just a few brand names, uh, because that's what people a lot of times would refer to. Um, they get really high concentration. So if you think about it, you're putting a huge concentration topically on an eye. And even the depth going into the cornea and conjunctival area, it's, it's huge, MIC-wise. Uh, even some of these can uh, have been documented to treat MRSA infections in the eye. But there's also uh, uh, trimethoprim uh, polymyxin that you can put in that not uncommonly people use for MRSA. One of the things that I grew up with trying to treat bacterial conjunctivitis was sodium sulfacetamide. Um, if you get more than 10% solution, it really stings a lot. People tend to hate that. They don't know what's worse, having the eye infection or the stinging from the drops. But uh, an older drug, obviously. Uh, and I listed on there, if it's, if it's gonorrhea, if that's what you think is going on, you see someone, maybe they give you a history that they also have a genital discharge along with this. Um, maybe tend to be a, a younger individual and you're worried about gonorrhea. While you're working this up, if that's your concern, the first thing you should do is give them a gram of ceftriaxone, either IV or IM. If you give it to them IM, they won't like you because it's not going to feel really very good at all, especially that volume. The reason to treat them and then have an ophthalmologist see them is if you wait to have the ophthalmologist see them again, this is, this is a really aggressive bacteria in the eye and it can perforate the cornea in um, sometimes just hours because people kind of take time before they come in to see you until I, I have to come in to see you because this is really not getting any better. So these are uh, some not so good ones. More commonly of what I've seen over the years has been kind of the upper left hand area with a little bit of discharge around the, the lid. And you can tell it's not only is it injected, but there's uh, some conjunctival hemorrhage associated with this as well. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody with the right upper one that bad, but um, I have seen once in my life downtown at the health department an individual came in and kind of like that with a, a significant discharge in the eye who was a partner of an individual who had gonorrhea and when they cultured that out it was gonorrhea but this multiple years ago and um, my understanding was that okay but yeah that was like we need to get you seen today by an ophthalmologist not next week today. Chlamydia um, obviously this is involvement a lot of times, if you're looking at developing countries, this is going to be what we discuss as trachoma, because it is tr uh, chlamydia trachomatis. Usually the um, serotypes A, B, and C, and then the D through K varieties are the genital ones more often than not. Um, then there are the other ones that are associated with lymphogranuloma venarium, which are the L1, L2, and L3 ones, which we're not going to talk about today. But you can see this because of um, hand contact. The other thing is just really bad um, hygiene and even flies have been known to transmit this occasionally just because that they tend to cluster on people's faces and they've been in areas which are not so sanitary. Um, so you can do it that way and uh, even by people that have a concurrent chlamydia genital tract infection can but pretty uncommonly get it in their eye. Uh, the usual kind of things we've talked about symptom wise it, it can either be acute or occasionally subacute. Um, lots of irritation and tearing and photosensitivity. When you see it in developing countries, it tends to, if it's trachoma, involve children more uh, than adults, but really the more severe things are seen because it's not treated. Uh, there, if there's no access to health care and there's no antibiotics to treat it, it becomes a smoldering chronic inflammatory disease and it's not the, uh, the infection that causes the damage. It's the sequela, it's the chronic inflammation, the scarring, and basically the introversion of the lid. So that basically what you have is your lashes rubbing on your eye on the cornea. So really the damage is more trauma 
because of the disease, not from the disease itself per se. Um, usually you don't get much of a discharge with this, but you see a lot of uh, follicular changes in the conjunctival sac area in the lid. Um, so again, workup of this. Um, a gram stain, is that going to help with this? Why not? Didn't chlamydia bacteria? Yes, it is a bacteria. But it doesn't have any mitochondria. It has to get its ATP from our cells, so it has to replicate in cells. So they're very small. You won't see the monogram stain, so that's not going to help. What really would help is to try and scrape some of the conjunctival area and looking for inclusion bodies. Um, or there is some data, actually, where there, there are financial resources to do it, that you can do amplified testing. Uh, same as you would in the, with genital mucosal areas, you can in the eye area as well to look for uh, chlamydia. Um, but yeah, this is one thing that you can do, and certainly you can do fluorescent antibody staining of conjunctival scrapings to see if there are inclusions. Um, there, there are several treatments that have been used. Uh, the, really, the oldest one has been tetracycline. The disincentive of tetracycline, it's extremely effective, but it's four times a day. If it's me, once a day is about the best you get, because I forget. Um, up until recently, and we've, the only reason was we've had issues with getting doxycycline in the United States recently, has been 100 milligram twice a day. And usually treat for um, a little longer than you would for genital tract infections, about uh, three weeks. The best thing to use, though, still, and now since it's, it's a generic drug and it's not as expensive as it used to be, is a gram of azithromycin as a single dose works great. There's been for many years a program that's um, been an international program with the drug company that used to make azithromycin Pfizer looking at developing countries where they go in every six months and they just treat everybody they can find with a gram of azithromycin or for younger weight-based and it works great. Uh, that way you know it, it, what you're preventing is you get a, uh, rid of the chlamydia, you get rid of the chronic inflammatory changes and things can get back uh, closer to normal unless there's already been severe damage to the cornea. Um, you could use topical erythromycin. Again, that's two to four times a day. If it's in the United States and you make a diagnosis of chlamydia in the eye, then you probably, uh, the diagnosis of chlamydia as a sexually transmitted infection means that any partner they've had within the last 60 days gets referred to the health department for evaluation and um, perhaps even treatment. So not uncommon, again, that kind of uh, cobblestone appearance to the conjunctiva. Over on the left-hand side, the, the white thing that you're seeing is a slit lamp. So that's what the little white line is. But it's just trying to show you how lumpy that line is. Uh, corneal ulcer, uh, a lot of potential things that could cause that. You see a whole list at the top. It could be trauma, foreign body, contact lens wear, uh, corneal exposure. But we worry about, with this talk really more infections. And um, usually it's going to be in one eye, rarely in both eyes, but usually in one eye. Um, and you're talking about decreased vision, a lot of tearing and photophobia associated with this because now it's on the cornea and that causes a, a, an exquisite amount of pain usually. What you really get worried about is getting a, a corneal infiltrate. Once you start getting growth of um, getting white cells into the cornea, trying to take care of things, and then trying to grow blood over to get more white cells, more oxygen, uh, antibodies, everything else, uh, once you get kind of almost a panis formation over the eye, obviously you lose sight. So that's what you don't want to have happen if you can prevent it. Uh, the other concern is uh, getting corneal thinning with the ulcer because if you get enough of it, then you can get penetration into the globe and that's a really bad thing. So all the other things we've talked about. The other thing is, um, you see on there it says possible hypopian. Do you know what a hypopian is? So if you see it in the eye, you're going to see it at the inferior area looking at the interior chamber, and you see a collection, kind of a crescent-shaped collection of white blood cells. If you see a hypopian, send them to an ophthalmologist because you're probably not going to be effective. It tells you there's already something going on in the eye. They're getting a really brisk inflammatory reaction. You may still be able to help, but they need to see this person like now. Um, if you start seeing problems with pupillary changes, uh, and we generally aren't the ones that are doing intraocular pressures, but um, you might see 
people because of this and changes within the eye of them getting an elevated intraocular pressure and a glaucoma manifestation. So usually what the ophthalmologist is going to do, and that's fine with me because I've never really tried on purpose to scrape somebody's cornea um, and getting them to hold still because you can do a lot of damage if you don't do it right. Uh, and they're going to look at that and see if they can see any kind of inclusion bodies, you know, the old Zonk smear looking at multinucleated giant cells is one of the things that they used to look at. But the other thing is uh, to do culture now, a lot of the things that we would end up doing is doing amplified testing, so for PCR. Um, obviously, the, the topical management ophthalmology is going to manage, uh, but we may end up being asked to see them because once they've had this, if it was, let's say, herpes simplex, there is a chance that it can recur in some people, and we may be asked to see them to recommend a prophylactic antiviral regimen for them. Um, but yet these are pretty obvious, and you do see the one on the right, and uh, we'll actually see it on both of them, the hypopian, and that tells you that this is this is now getting out of our league and getting into uh, the ophthalmologist area. Uh, the one on the left is not hard to see. The one on the right is not so hard to see, and occasionally you have to tangentially take your your light source and see if you can see a change there. Uh, you would if you had a fluorescein drop that you could put in there or a piece of paper that had fluorescein on it, but um, sometimes they can be very subtle. Since we mentioned herpes, um, it's not uncommon for it to be a primary infection, and that's, those are usually severe. Remember that they have, um, talking about you know the uh, initial infection, which is if you've never had HSV-1 or 2, it tends to be a, a really severe infection. It takes longer to heal. So if you've already had HSV-1 or HSV-2 and you get the, the non-primary infection, it tends to be not quite as bad for most people. Um, so history may be able to help you with that, but generally people are going to come in because this really hurts. I mean, any corneal abrasion or, or ulceration hurts. Um, if it's a reactivation, it tends not to be quite as acute. As you can see, um, asymptomatic to mild pain or foreign body sensation, just because it hangs in there doesn't get any better. So if you have a persistent pain, somebody that has more lenses and devices than we do needs to see them and uh, can stain them a little bit better. Um, so again, looking at a, a vesicular blepharitis, so if you see injection in the eye, especially a limbal right around where you see the edge of the cornea, so if you get a limbal injection with that and it, it's persistent, they probably need to see them. With any of the viral infections, with chlamydia, uh, lots of other bacterial infections, one of the things, that, and unfortunately it's not all that specific, but it's usually something you can see is a preauricular lymphadenopathy. So, you know, seeing that is, it does tell you that obviously you're getting drainage into that area, but it's unfortunately not all that specific with these eye infections. Um, and latent, you can see uh, getting into a larger geographic ulcer. And one of the problems is that when you start seeing these, and they talk about these dendritic ulcers, we do it to ourselves unconsciously because we blink. You get a corneal ulcer, and sometimes what you see is, uh, oh, I, it's on the next slide. Some of the pictures is you'll see the little ulcers kind of going this way, and then we do this because it hurts, and then we drag the lid back and forth, and we move infected material across the eye and stuff. And so you can see sometimes the dendritic pattern because of where the eye is just, the eyelid is dragging infected material and getting more of the cornea. Um, this is another one that needs to go to the ophthalmologist. They may have to try and debride the area to scrape some of it off. They're going to use a topical. Um, antiviral, it may be trifluoridine or uh, vidarabine topically. They usually give a cycloplegic agent. What, what is a cycloplegic agent? What do they do? If someone used a cycloplegic agent in one eye in a person and you walked in to see them like what happened when I was a resident here in the ICU because somebody forgot to tell the nurses or anybody else, they put a cycloplegic agent in one eye so they could see the retina. And then somebody came over and said, oh, my God, he's got a blown, pu blown pupil. Uh, so, yeah, if you're going to use that, make sure people know, put something in the chart or whatever that you've dilated the eye. So this keeps the eye dilated and helps to prevent problems with um, uh, acute angle glaucoma and other pressure things. Uh, usually ophthalmologists like to use preventative antibiotics. Uh, we tend to not like to use preventative antibiotics, but this is topical in the area and preventing with a corneal ulcer. There could be a chance of getting a bacterial infection. Um, they may or may not use topical or oral steroids, and we usually get involved because now that they've had a nasty corneal ulcer, 
uh, they are potentially at risk for having it. And we usually recommend either chronic acyclovir or valacyclovir, usually prophylactic doses like you would use for genital uh, prophylaxis as well. So you can see some of these were stain Some was a rose bengal at the uh, upper left. And you see that dendritic. Isn't it interesting how they're kind of linear? And then you look at the other one, and it's kind of almost acro across at a, uh, a 9 to 6 or, or a 9 to 3 o'clock, and then get that other about 6 o'clock. Um, the thing you don't want is what you see on the right-hand side is chronic inflammation. You can't really see the ulcer defined too well on this. But all the vessels and all the white cells getting in because now you have essentially no vision in that eye. You can see light, but you can't see clarity of anything. Um, just to mention to you, acanth amoeba, so talking about, uh, unfortunately, unicellular organisms. This gets a big, uh, or has had a lot of press because of uh, contaminated contact lenses, some of which came that way from the manufacturer. Um, most of which in the past has happened because before we had nice things that you could keep your lenses in, uh, with the older soft lenses, what they would tell people is you had to keep them in a saline solution that you were supposed to do yourself. And you were supposed to boil the water. And some people said, that's too, too much trouble. So I just put some salt tablets in water and I put my lenses in it. Where does acanthamoeba live? In water. Could it survive and be actually in community water systems? Occasionally. Usually not, but occasionally. Um, so that was the biggest problem, and it was just because that they didn't get disinfect their soft lenses, the acanthamoeba would hang on to them, and then you feed them because you put the lens in your eye. And they see food, and they attack your eye. And it's usually a slow-growing kind of uh, an infection, unfortunately. Uh, but you can get it anywhere that you have water. It can be in a swimming pool, uh, showering while you're wearing your lenses, and get water in your eye. Uh, occasionally it's been noted pretty uncommonly, but... Um, eye trauma, especially if it's something that's been wet uh, that's gotten to the eye. So again, it's going to involve an eye scraping and you're going to use something uh, maybe as sophisticated as confocal microscopy to actually see the organisms. Uh, the treatment is not fun. It's using a very dilute solution of chlorhexidine gluconate and uh, polyhexamethyl biguanide every hour while awake. And I guess if, if your eye was really hurting, if you cut early, that might be so bad. But every hour while awake, you better get them all in during the daytime hours because I'm not planning on waking up to keep putting drops in my eye. Um, so you do that for the first week, and then they taper it out. They have other regimens that they use now, but that was the one that uh, seemed to be more commonly listed when I looked this up. Uh, some of these are pretty subtle. If you look at the top layer of these pictures, it's really tough to see. The one on the upper left, if you look right where that you see the iris um, uh, and, and actually the pupil area in there, uh, it's cloudy. That's where the, the acanthamoeba is. It's pretty subtle. The other one you're seeing, uh, trying to take a slit lamp, and you see just a little bit of that going through there, and, and it's really tough to see, but you see a faint little line. The other one is really tough, but you see it at about 2 o'clock area, also there. The ones on the bottom aren't so hard. I mean, if somebody came in with the one on the bottom left, I don't think you would have a problem s noticing that because they're going to complain they can't see. And it's probably hurting and having other problems. So the ones on the bottom, what you see is a ring because as this moves, it's feeding and going out. So if you start seeing a ring that en enlarges, not a good sign. Um, the other thing that we get asked to see for assistant management is uh, preceptal and orbital cellulitis. And, and what was the old term for preceptal? Periorbital. So if somebody tells you they thought somebody had periorbital cellulitis, the newer term now is preceptal. It looks at the anatomy of the eye. Um, it can be an infection anywhere on the face. You know, that wonderful triad that you're not supposed to, if you get a zit or a sty in your eye or whatever, you're not supposed to squeeze it or anything else because you can directly inoculate it and get it locally and get it to go into the eye or into the circulation and get a cavernous sinus thrombosis or other really bad things out of this. Uh, it can be uh, because of a sinus infection and local extension from that. It can be from eye trauma uh, as a complication of surgery in that area or vascular extension because of facial cellulitis or other things. Um, both of these present as redness and uh, erythema, warmth to that peri 
orbital area, and sometimes it's tough to tell if somebody has preceptal or orbital cellulitis from it without getting some kind of an imaging scan. CTs are, are really good for looking at this. The big thing is if you can get someone to open their eye, what happens when you have them tell them to move their eye to look left and look right if they have orbital cellulitis? Do they like to do that? No. Do they want to move their eye left and right? No. And a lot of times they'll tell you, I can't. It hurts too bad. I can't move my eye. It really hurts. So that's not a good sign. Um, they may tell you that they have double vision. And there's really a, a, an easy little tool that you can use to give you a very gross evaluation to see if that's true. And it's called a red glass test. You just need either a piece of film that's red or a piece of red glass. And you have them hold it over one eye and nothing on the other eye and you hold a pen light in front of them, right directly in front of them, and say, how many lights do you see? And they should see a red and a white light on top of each other. Have them look to the left. Do they still have convergence of both of those points of light? If so, then their vision is what? So that consensual vision on that side. So the eye's working perfect. If they look to the other side and they said, no, the red light is like to the left of the white light. It tells you that something's wrong with that eye. So they do, have, they do see double, and you can actually use that to figure out which eye is really the problem with this. So it's just a very easy way of seeing, because some people tell you, I got double vision, which they really mean I have blurry vision. It's, you know, I'm seeing two of things. Well, it's because that you have the stigmatism or something else. Um, and occasionally it's come in handy. And I, I'll be happy to show you the one that I carry, which was out of some old emergency light kit thing for a car, and I was throwing it out because it was way too old and didn't work, but it had one red glass thing with it as an emergency thing. So um, The other things you see on there, it's not uncommon to see conjunctival chemosis. Um, you might see proptosis where it looks like the eye is being pushed out, but again, sometimes it's tough when you've got that much fluid around the eye and you're seeing you know, chemosis of the eye to see if, if really is the eye pushed out or not. Um, in kids, usually about the only way to really get an idea of what's going on. They're tough to look at, they squirm, they don't like it, it hurts, is to get a CT scan. Generally you're going to treat very broadly until you can figure out exactly what's going on. Um, if, uh, let's say that you screen them and they didn't seem to have MRSA, then you could use either NAF or, or cefazolin. Uh, MRSA, maybe Vanco, and then ceftriaxone and metronidazole until you really kind of figure out what's going on. Chance of this being pseudomonas is probably slim to none. So you, you know, you could use something with pseudomonas coverage, but you probably don't really need to. Uh, could you use something else? Could you use uh, an anti-pseudomonal penicillin, beta-lactamase inhibitor combo, you know, like Zosin or something else? I guess you could. Um, but if you can find an abscess, there's a very low threshold to trying to get it drained because they tend to only get worse. Um, so if you kind of look at this cartoonish drawing here, diffuse cellulitis in the eye versus an orbital abscess or a subperiosteal abscess. And again, those are going to push the eye and generally give you some kind of visual problem. The thing that's really going to be tough is cavernous sinus thrombosis. And those, that's usually the one we have the worst success with. So if you're getting a CT scan, you see over on the left-hand side, um, can you see on the, um, the left eye, the one on the right-hand side, I think you can see where there's an abscess on that nasal side of that orbit and it is pushing the eye up and out a little bit. So if you look at that cut, uh, the eye, you can see, is kind of proptotic. And then you look at the one down below it, and you can see exactly where that abscess is in that sinus cavity. So it's going to be kind of superior, um, more medial area, and it is pushing on that eye. And you can see that there's also an associated maxillary sinusitis. So that's probably where it came from. Um, on this side, you see it looked like a horrible eye at the top. Uh, I don't have a CT scan for that, but when you look at the southern of the child, what do you see? The eye looks fine. There's really nothing, at, at least in what signs as you can see, but what you see is swelling of the tissue on the outside. So that's preceptal cellulitis. If you can get the eye open, they generally can move the eye around, and it, it's that one I don't worry quite as much about, but again, any infection on the face I do get really concerned about. Uh, and the same kind of thing here. The only other thing I would suggest to you is, and to show you that it's really tough to tell what's going on with the eye by looking at it up on the, the top picture. Getting the eye open on the bottom, it's tough to know if there's proptosis of the eye because if you've got that much chemosis, um, I mean, it's just, I can't tell. 
So once you get the scan, is that eye proptotic or not? From that cut, I don't know, because you don't get enough of the other orbit in that one. And you can see the lens in this one. So you're not, that, that image is a little, the cut's a little off. But if you, if you went through those, it does look like it, it is somewhat proptotic, and there's something going on down around the optic nerve with that individual. So that one makes me think more of an orbital cellulitis. Uh, the other thing we worry about is endogenous endophthalmitis. Um, not to spend a huge amount of time on this, it's fortunately pretty uncommon. And you see the cause of agents, more often than not, it's fungal. Why would you think more fungal infections getting into the eye? Just fungus floating around in people. Something's predisposing them. They're either going to be immune compromised or on long courses of antibiotics. I've seen a few, not many fortunately, but a few in people getting treated for either endocarditis or osteomyelitis who ended up saying, I'm having problems with my vision. It's blurry or I can't see too well. And when they look in the eye, as you'll see in the next picture, you do see these cotton wool spots kind of in the, the fundus, uh, well, on a fundoscopy um, examination, fundoscopic examination. Uh, fortunately, not so much gram-negative, occasionally gram-positive, but most of this is going to be fungal. Either, again, drug use, uh, surgery, but the biggest thing uh, also is having long-term IV catheter in because if they get infected, uh, then you can see, you know, an embolus going occasionally. You can see that in the eye, but most of the time it's going to be in that second one, immune suppressed or because of therapies. Um, Anti-metabolite, again, goes back to malignancies. And then chronic immune compromising debilitating diseases, people with really uncontrolled diabetes, uh, dialysis patients, et cetera, because they are they're really set up for this. They get exposed to antibiotics not uncommonly and probably don't get exposed to too much antifungal therapy. Uh, the most common agent that you see is going to be Canada, Canada species, more often than not Canada albicans, which is fortunate because it usually responds best. So in the top image, what you see is really kind of a cloudy looking vitreous, and you see the really white area uh, at about, um, well, about a disc diameter or so away from the optic nerve that you see over on the left. And then above that, at uh, probably about 1130 another white spot, and then um, that was after seven days of therapy, and then this is after six weeks of therapy, and um, now you can actually see the macular area, and it looks like that there's sparing of the macula, which is fortunate, because so that means our central vision is hopefully still fairly intact. Um, Dacrocystitis, uh, we see that from time to time, and that's again going to be looking at drainage of the eye, and usually starts out at the punctal area in the canthus area. Um, if it gets really bad occasionally, the thing will try and drain itself and have a fistulous tract that opens. Fortunately, it tends to heal itself and close as opposed to having a chronic infection like an osteomyelitis that forms a fistula and just keeps draining or inflammatory bowel disease. Um, the other thing is that because you, you've blocked up that duct with infection, the people are going to just be incessantly tearing because they have no way of actually internalizing it back and having it go into the nasopharyngeal area to drain. Um, just to give you an idea, and, and the other problem is usually if you get these treated and get them drained, people do okay, but you can end up having eye problems, cavern sinus thrombosis, and if things go really bad, not surviving. it. But it just gives you kind of an idea, a couple of different images of individuals having dacrocystitis. I've seen this a few times. I don't think I've been asked to see anybody with this for a while. Um, I'm sure ophthalmologists get asked to see it a lot more frequently than we do, but um, this is out of uh, the digital archives that they have at Harvard. And as you know, they have their big mass uh, eye and ear institute there, so they see a lot of different things. Uh, there was, I think a couple of years ago, there was a, a really nice presentation by one of the ID people who says, I spend most of my day at least two, maybe three times a day running back over between the eye institute and on doing ID rounds because of what they end up seeing and just so that she can help participate. Um, and to finish this up, just to show you a few things, some, this is an individual that you're seeing and they have this chronic itch, itchy eye, maybe a little bit of photophobia, but a really nasty foreign body infection or, or sensation in their left eye. On the right eye, when you flip the lid up, that's what it looks like. And there's the, uh, the left eye, as you can see. And there, there's some noticeable things with that left eye. And somebody's put a little bit of maybe Rose Bengal staining in it. What's going on? 
Can you describe what you see with the eye? Okay, we'll look at the one on the left. Um, it doesn't look like, and it's a, a really bad picture, but it doesn't look like that the conjunctiva is really tremendously inflamed. But what do you see when you introvert the lid or evert the lid? It's kind of cobblestone, right? So something's going on with that. And then look at the eyelashes on this side. What's wrong with the lashes? Yeah, they're broken. Looks like even some of them maybe have you know, kind of been pulled out almost and stuff. And it's because that they're trying to pull that lid down. You can't see that these lids actually inverted. So what do you think is going on with this individual? What do they have? Let's say that they're in some way out of the way place in Australia. So you're having Australian Aborigines, very, very way rural area. Kids. So that's trachoma. And yes, it's even in Australia and other parts of the world too. Okay, this is an individual who had spent time in India uh, and then came back and had this foreign body, really odd sensation in her eye and came in and said, I don't know, it just feels like that, you know, it's vibrating or something in my eye and you take a look. Do you see anything on that image on the left side there? You see something in there, don't you? So what is it? It sounds Hawaiian, <laughs> but it's not. Sure, Loa Loa. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's one of the areas where you can see this. And again, it's, it is vector driven. Uh, we end up getting this, and that's one of the areas where you can see this is in the eye. And it can, I didn't put it in here. But there are actually pictures of this thing going across the cornea. That would be probably the thing that I wouldn't sleep for weeks if that ever happened to me, is to see something kind of going across your eye and then knowing it's a worm. I don't think I'd deal with that too well. Um, so yes, low, low. Um, this individual comes in and just by seeing these lesions, I don't even really have to tell you anything. So what does he have that you can see after having uh, chlamydia urethritis, actually even gonococcal urethritis uh, or um, cervicitis. You can see it after uh, some bacterial gastroenteritis bacteria as a sequela. Reactive arthritis. Excellent. Reactive arthritis. Or the old name of Reiter's syndrome. Every time I say Reiter's syndrome, now everybody corrects me. Oh, you mean reactive arthritis. Yes, Reiter's syndrome. That's why I said no, reactive arthritis. What's the mnemonic or, or the saying that people use when they're talking about Reiter's syndrome, the triad of things? I was always taught conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. So what do they say now, as was taught to me by a resident several years ago? Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Same thing. Now, there are some other lesions that you can see besides just the arthritis and maybe the urethritis on there, but there are some other lesions on that gentleman's penis that you might see occasionally with reactive arthritis. That's the circinate balanitis. The thing you see on the feet, Keratoderma blenerogicum. Absolutely. So that one has, actually, that's, that's would, if that was one person, that would be the horrible, most worst case of writers I think I've ever seen. Um, this is a very, very nice young lady who uh, came in actually here several years ago, uh, was sent by primary care because, as you can see, she's got this eye that's red, um, and also it looked like to them that she had a little bit of swelling on the left side of her face, and they wanted to Tell us what antibiotic to give her. The only thing historically that we could figure out, really no travel or anything else, was that she had just gotten a new kitten a couple of weeks ago. Pictured here. <laughs> <laughs> Very small. So that's the only thing that was new in her life, and it seemed to kind of follow just uh, two or three weeks afterwards. What do you think that she might have? Sure. So what would we call that? Disease. Cat scratch disease. That's what it seemed to be. We tried to draw blood and send it over uh, one of our colleagues over at the uh, 
College of Medicine, uh, Bert Anderson, that's what he used to do when he was at CDC, he was look at uh, cat scratch disease. And um, I forget what the issue was, but we gave her azithromycin and it all got better. So we figured it probably was uh, cat scratch. Can't absolutely prove it, but it, it, cause and effects sounded like the treatment worked. And the last one, it shouldn't be too much of a challenge for you. What do you think that this is? A, extremely bad luck. B, way too hot compresses put on the face. Or C, something else. <laughs> Probably something else. So what is it? What do you think? I will give you a hint. It's in the herpes virus family. And it's not herpes simplex. <laughs> it's not cytomegalovirus or Epstein-Barr virus. It's not HHV 6, 7, or 8. Did I cover them all? <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? Herpes zoster. Herpes zoster. I don't know how you do it. That, that's absolutely what this is. Uh, and that's where it's already erupted. Unfortunately, I could show you tons of pictures because of the vaccine studies that we had done. I don't know how many people I saw trying to determine if they had shingles or not, but we did PCR to see if it was VZV or HSV. And actually we found some that have zosteriform herpes simplex, which is very interesting. We had two at this facility that ended up had more than one eruption. It, was in a, it looked like it was in a dermatomal area, but it was absolutely not zoster. But I, I can guarantee you most people would have thought it was and would have treated them. Remember that you use higher doses of acyclovir if you're going to treat zoster. So instead of if you use the old regimen of 200 milligram capsules five times a day, which is horrible, um, you would need 800 milligrams five times a day to treat zoster. And a lot of people don't remember that. Uh, my preference is to use um, really a pre-drug, if you will, to use either famcyclovir or valacyclovir. Get higher serum levels with those. But uh, the one on the side, all these are which cranial nerve? Yes, cranial nerve piece, cranial nerve five. So that would be the first branch on the left and the second branch on the second. The other thing just to mention to you is notice that they both have involvement uh, the side and the tip of the nose. They have what's called Hutchinson sign. With that, it tells you around 50 to 75, 80 percent of the time they're going to have eye involvement of something, either ptosis or have ciliary, um, I'm sorry, not ciliary muscle, um, mine went blank, um, eye muscle involvement, for lack of better medical terminology. Um, so they won't be able to move their eye as well. They're going to have some kind of uh, erectus nerve palsy or something else going on. Um, but you can get this getting into the eye and even have an optic neuritis out of it. But um, more often than not, what you see is kind of a ptosis uh, on both these. This one on the right-hand side I took care of as a resident when we used to have a hemoc specific ward here and um, had an underlying malignancy but came in with that and the first diagnosis by someone else was mucor. <laughs> and then they left the room and never came back. So if this was mucormycosis, what he needed to be on was on two things. The first was the operating table and the second thing he needed to be on was amphotericin B at really high doses but this ended up not being that. Um, and from his zoster did fine, but un unfortunately didn't do well from his malignancy. So with that, I'll stop. And thank you very much for your time.